Thank you very much, um, Larry. So I'm a urologist. Uh, I've probably interacted with a lot of you along the way. Um, uh, but my research is focused on health services research, patient-centered outcomes research, uh, the development of patient-centered resources for cancer care. Um, and so um, what I want to talk today about, I actually gave um, a little bit of a discussion about this in this venue, gosh, like four or five years ago, when it was really just a concept. And so now this concept is something a bit more real, and I'm excited to talk to you about some of our results. So I, I want to talk about patient-centered pathology reporting for cancer care. Um, these are my disclosures. They're funding disclosures. A lot of the work that I'm going to present to you today was funded by a grant from the American Cancer Society. So a little bit of background on some of the concepts underlying the work that we're doing. It's funny because I was a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar, and back then, I really thought that I was going to have this quantitatively oriented research career. I was very into quality of care, and I was into high-level econometric methods for looking at secondary data. And I came here, and one of the first things I did was I just met with a bunch of people. Larry and I had had these wonderful discussions when I had been interviewing for a job here, and so he was on my list. And I learned that um, this place has tremendous strengths in biomedical informatics, um, in health services research. Um, and I, I got intrigued by concepts around user-centered design and how we can create solutions that can be built into clinical practice. So, so much of what I had done as a fellow was identifying problems. And there's this sort of naivety to it that is sort of like, um, I'm going to show the world a problem and someone out there is going to fix it. And so I, I learned that um, that doesn't happen in healthcare. <laughs> and so I wanted to be part of generating, building, developing some solutions. So user-centered design is the idea that we engage our, our target stakeholders, our target user, users, in the iterative development of new technologies that are going to be put to market. And our market is the clinic. And so as you build something, you try to solicit that stakeholder input all along the pathway. And sort of a background conceptual model that I've thought a lot about with respect to this is the chronic care model. And the chronic care model explains how we can do a better job managing chronic health conditions like diabetes and hypertension. And as a urologist, I can tell you that a lot of the cancers that I treat are akin to chronic conditions. I would argue that prostate cancer is very much like a chronic condition because of its indolence. Bladder cancer, because of its frequency of recurrences and need for frequent interactions with the healthcare system, is very much a chronic condition. And where I really want to generate support for my patients is in this concept of self-management support. So way back when, I started building quality of life tools that can be integrated into clinical practice. And the idea was if we create these quality of life dashboards that allow patients to interact with their quality of life outcomes, that emboldens them to participate in their self-management support. But some things have happened in the interim that have influenced my thinking and generated some of the concepts for this. And some of it is purely the exposure of doing that prior work. So a couple of background pieces of information. So in 2009, the High Tech Act was passed. And so one of the big terms that comes out of the High Tech Act is meaningful use of electronic health records. So number one, almost all of our health systems need to have electronic health records. So this is where a lot of large health systems purchased health records if they didn't have them before. But that meaningful use also extended to patient health records. So that's where things like MyChart came from, where the High Tech Act. And then more recently, in 2016, the Cures Act. The Cures Act had a lot of really important provisions in it, but one wasn't enacted until 2021, and that's the information blocking provision. And this is the thing that has caused a tremendous amount of distress, where health information that's put in patients' records is immediately released to the patient. Laboratory information, pathology information, notes, and so patients are granted this information without context, without support, and that influences a lot of how I've been thinking about this. Well, I think some of the best ideas come out of serendipity. And so as part of our quality of life work, um, I sat in a lot of support groups in the Puget Sound corridor, um, listening to men talk about their new prostate cancer diagnosis. And um, you know, my goal was to learn how to build better quality of life tools 
but I bore witness to what appeared to be a large gap in men's ability to relay really important information about their new prostate cancer diagnosis. So <clears throat> I did sort of a back of the envelope with all of the support group leaders that I had partnered with, and I asked them, well, what is your perception of patient knowledge about their new prostate cancer diagnosis? And they felt like almost everyone knows their PSA. Your PSA is this kind of score you carry with you. You know, you go from your, P your PCP with a PSA of 4.5 to your urologist with a PSA of 4.5 and you get your biopsy. But everything that comes after that is a little bit of a gray area. And so, you know, the Gleason sum, what we now call the Gleason grade group, um, how many biopsy cores are involved, if you're considered low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk, there appear to be large gaps in patients' understanding about that. So we did a local survey of uh, patients that participate in these, these support groups, and we asked them about their perceptions of their report, um, but also this conceptual idea of a patient-centered pathology report. And I think most notably, there wasn't a single person that thought that it wouldn't be helpful in some way. There are some things that we think it might support, like communication with your doctor, communication with your family. Maybe it emboldens you to take a more active role in your healthcare, but it was hard for patients to envision a way in which it would not help. So we went back and we started with sort of a, a landscape survey of what is known in this domain. You know, is anyone else working in this space? Um, are there ongoing sort of renovations um, in the field of pathology related to this. And so we did an evidence review um, that Larry was part of. And this was led by uh, a resident at the time who's now junior faculty uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And the idea was, well, who is the audience of um, quality assurance, quality improvement projects around pathology reporting? And we identified four pretty consistent themes. There's a lot of work around content standardization. Um, and related to that, you know, a lot of demonstration of high variability, especially across centers, not within centers, but across centers, in pathology report content. There was a lot of work on how pathology reports can better communicate new diagnoses with clinicians, but we really couldn't find anything that targeted the patient as a user of their own pathology report. So it appeared that there was a gap in ongoing work to create basically tools that help patients better understand their pathology. So another important background to this is just sort of the existing state of literacy and health literacy in America, which has some notable, impressive, and disconcerting gaps. So about um, almost one in three, about 25% of Americans have what we would qualify as limited literacy, and this is based on the Adult Literacy in America survey by the Department of Education. Um, and it's not surprising where you might find some subgroups that are at higher risk for illiteracy, including those of lower socioeconomic status, those of a lower education level, and unfortunately, those that have a greater burden of health problems, which is linked to those first two categories. Specifically, you know, when it comes to health literacy, and I think this number is probably an underestimate, they found that about 30 million adults have below what we would consider to be a basic health literacy. And that's often measured with like a simple act of asking you to relay medical terms back at me, which is um, maybe an insufficient screen for health literacy deficiencies. Um, the problem with that is that the persons who most need tools that help them better understand their health and their management of their health are the ones whose overall health predisposes to being poor. So health literacy is a cofactor with poor overall health. Um, so basically, you know, those who are in most need of excellent health literacy are the ones who unfortunately suffer with the poorest health. So with that in mind, we learned that patients are not commonly considered a stakeholder in their pathology. Well, what can we do locally? You know, is this something where we can just take a pathology report and make some very simple changes and generate a patient-centered pathology report? So this was also work led by, by Matt Mosinen, and we took uh, urologic cancer reports and we made some very simple changes. So the first change we made was we just got rid of all of the gross and IHC content. That often has longer sentences, bigger words, creates a lot of confusion. So if we just delete that content, does that change the readability of the reports? And the answer is not really all that much. 
Then we replace some of the key terms like um, conventional adenocarcinoma of the prostate with simple versions of it like prostate cancer. And we tried to see if that you know, was associated with a substantial reduction in the reading grade level needed to interact with those reports. And again, the answer was it didn't change all that much. And so what we learned from that is that a more sort of iterative, patient-centered outcomes research process was needed. You know, going back to that concept of user-centered design, it seemed like simplifying these reports through deletion might improve readability a little bit, but not enough that the average person could successfully read these reports. So this is something where um, the concept of patient-centered outcomes research is pretty new. So health services research has been around for a long time. Um, you know, one of the oldest major health services research studies was the RAND Health Insurance Experiment, which took place in the 70s and early 80s. But a lot of HSR has been focused on, you know, pointing at problems. You know, what I focused on as, as a fellow. The idea of constructing solutions, well, there's no sort of like golden textbook that we can call on that says, well, you know, John, you want to build patient-centered pathology reports. Here's how you do it. So we kind of had to come up with what we thought was a sensible process for doing this. And so we started with expert panels. And those expert panels are comprised of pathologists, clinicians, researchers, patients. And we asked them, you know, if you look at these reports and we list all the elements that are part of these standard reports, what are the ones that are most germane to treatment decision making and prognosis? So can we whittle down a fairly extensive comprehensive report and focus only on those, those elements that are particularly salient to treatment decision making and prognosis. And then we take those elements and we go back to our patients and we say, well gosh, how can we convey these clinically important elements in ways that patients can understand? Not just through wording, but through layouts, um, through diagrams or, or tables or whatever it may require. And then to see if it worked, we pilot it in practice. And so one thing that our patients fed back to us, and actually this was feedback I, I got here when I talked about this as a concept several years back, is that you know, these reports necessarily contain less information than standard reports. And so both patients and this audience felt like it was really critical that these don't replace these reports. These are an augment, an adjunct to these reports. So when we constructed our pilot studies, what we would do is we would randomize patients to either receive their standard report or their standard report place, plus a patient-centered version of the report. And then, you know, not knowing exactly what outcomes we, we know might be improved uh, from this, we kind of went back to our conceptual chronic care model and thought about what we hypothesized would be better. We hypothesized that patients would have greater knowledge for their new cancer diagnosis we hypothesized that it might help them have better communication with their doctors. We hypothesized that it might embolden them to have greater self-efficacy or sort of a belief that they can manage their health condition. Um, and we hypothesized that it might influence their sort of decisional conflict, the idea that you know, making a decision is hard and burdensome for you. So these were some of the outcomes that we looked at. So I'm going to show you some of our pilot data. Our first pilot was in bladder cancer. And I, I feel like I keep showing this name Mosinin, but he's really responsible, as Larry knows, for doing a lot of this foundational work. And it was this foundational work that led to the American Cancer Society funding that, that I'm going to talk about today. So this was our pilot bladder cancer report. And one thing that strikes me right off the bat looking at this is this is not a report that can be feasibly in integrated into EPIC today. And a lot of what we built um, so there's this thing we call maturation bias, which is that, you know, in the process of doing your study, uh, maturation bias is usually like a sad thing that you have to talk about. So in the process of doing your study, something happens that changes your ability to either complete your study or it changes the interaction with your outcome. So for example, if I were doing a screening study of black men with prostate cancer and Barack Obama was diagnosed with prostate cancer, that would influence my intervention to try to increase screening among black men. Uh, here, the maturation bias that occurred was D1. And so we had constructed the ability to generate these tools within PowerPath, where basically, I don't want to minimize how easy it was, but essentially, you kind of hit a button 
and it would generate a patient-centered pathology report as essentially the last page on the report. And because we could generate that report within Word, we could do some cool things with format and with figures and pictures and tables and things like that. So this is our bladder cancer report. Um, a couple things I want to call your attention to. So it has a call and response format. And this is pursuant to some bladder cancer patient feedback that they wanted the report to sort of tell them a story about their cancer. Um, and we also wanted to arm them with some of the questions that they might ask of their provider. It has a figure. Um, so a very common bit of feedback we get is some kind of visual description of my cancer. And it has some representation of sort of what does this mean for my cancer. And so in the sake of, of this bladder cancer report, it's reflected in this line, what are the chances that my tumor will come back? And then all of these reports include sort of like a summary. You know, what's the bottom line about my cancer? This is sort of like the line that you can take to the internet and try to learn more about it. So uh, we did a pilot with 40 patients. So we had about 20 in each arm. Uh, you know, these small pilots, even though we kind of block randomize patients, it's impossible in such a small pilot to weed out you know, essential variation between these two groups that would require a larger study. But you can see that patients who were randomized to receive the patient-centered pathology report in general had greater knowledge for their new bladder cancer diagnosis. And the two core elements that our experts felt were salient to decision-making to risk stratification of bladder cancer were stage and grade. It's one of the simpler reports that we deal with. And so clearly, being exposed to the patient-centered pathology report seem to convey knowledge about this new cancer diagnosis better than the standard report. I would argue that even though we consider this a positive pilot, you know, none of those bars are close to 100. So there still is a very large gap in trying to communicate this information to patients. And that gap is only going to get bigger in some of the other slides that I'm going to show you. So we went on and we did a prostate cancer pilot. And I should update this. I'm sorry. This was uh, published in Prostate Cancer Prosthetic Diseases. And this is our pilot prostate biopsy report. And it is more complex because there is more information to communicate within a prostate biopsy report. So <clears throat> in terms of the important elements that we were hoping to communicate with this report, we were hoping to communicate grade because that's such a key component of risk stratification in prostate cancer, but also volume of cancer based on the biopsies because that um, oftentimes is used to generate uh, your sense that the patient is a candidate for more conservative strategies like active surveillance. So the volume of cancer on the biopsies is also really important. So this is necessarily a little bit of a harder um, report to process, but similarly, our patients that were exposed to the patient-centered pathology report exhibited greater knowledge for their Gleason sum and greater knowledge for the volume of cancer compared with the patients that got the standard report. We had more patients in this pilot, and this is reflective of some of the challenges we have with this program with our local patient population. So as we started accruing patients to this, we learned very quickly that we don't primarily diagnose a lot of prostate cancers in our system. We are a referral center. That's just who we are. And so what we ended up doing was we ended up allowing for the recruitment of second opinions. And so you can see that these numbers are a lot higher but a lot of these are patients who've already been exposed to their pathology. They've already been disclosed that they have prostate cancer and they've learned a lot about it. And so I, I consider this to sort of represent a bit of an upper bound in knowledge for this prostate cancer biopsy report. So um, we felt like we had a good idea. Um, we felt like we had an idea that could be broadened to a broader audience. But to do that, we wanted to think about sort of the common cancers in men and women and how we can build a tool that is um, uh, a broad tool as well as a, a deep tool. And so we wanted to look at doing this in other cancers. And so this is where we were able to secure some funding from the American Cancer Society to build reports for colon uh, and rectum as well as for breast. Um, and in doing this, we went back to square one. So we started all over again with these qualitative explorations of what it means to have a new cancer diagnosis, what it means to get your pathology report. And we found some very consistent themes. So what was really validating about this process in very different cancers, you have prostate cancer that's all men, breast cancer that's all women, um, and you know across these sort of demographic changes based on these cancer types, 
there were a lot of common themes. Um, and one of them is just that a new cancer diagnosis is really hard. And it's very hard to process new information when you're confronting this new cancer diagnosis. Um, and you know, not unexpectedly, because these uh, patients were not patients that maybe got their primary diagnosis here, how this information is communicated often influences how patients use their pathology report in their clinical care. So for example, our patients told us that when their doctor, who was disclosing their new cancer diagnosis to them, printed out their pathology report, you know, wrote on it, wrote some notes on it, and handed it to them, they were more often to take that with them to the oncology visit or to talk to their family about their cancer diagnosis. These are focus group participants, so these represent some of the more activated cancer patients that you're going to interact with. So it's not surprising that they're going to be more likely to take their pathology report with them to different appointments. Um, but they felt like there were opportunities to maybe have greater engagement in their cancer care that were missed along the way. Um, the other thing that we learned is that we learned that, you know, there are some commonalities between our bladder and our prostate report, and you're going to see that a lot of those commonalities carry through to our breast cancer report, and that's because we, we, we arrived at some similar themes that we think is going to make it more efficient to start the same process over with a new cancer today. So if I were to build a new patient-centered pathology report for kidney cancer, I think I would have a head start on building that because some of this foundational work, qualitative work with patients, I think we could move past and go straight to some of the language elements. So uh, report layout, you know, we don't want just a, a, a huge list of text. Um, we want headings so that they know that you're talking about a different element of the pathology report. We want to make sure that the terms that we use are very consistent. So one thing we learned from patients across cancer types is that the words positive and negative are really confusing. You know, people think positive is good. Well, in most pathology, positive is bad. And so it's very confusing. And, and as we thought about that, you know, um, uh, you know, one patient mentioned that um, their surgical margin was close. And they thought that was great, sort of like close but no cigar. But that actually meant that they needed to have another surgery. And so, um, you know, trying to figure out how to, uh, how to integrate consistent terms and phrasing into these PCPRs was really important. Um, <clears throat> they want to see what is negative on their report, like what is not shown. So, for example, with um, receptor status on the breast cancer reports, they wanted to see all three receptors, not just the ones that were positive. They wanted to know the ones that were negative as well. So thinking about pertinent negative findings was really important. And then this idea of sort of a, a trusted shepherd, like where can I go to get information that is actually going to help me and not scare me or not be misinformation? And so is there a way to provide links to external resources? And we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, and then, you know, in terms of uh, information flow, we wanted this to sort of be a reverse pyramid. So we want to go from broad concepts, what did my biopsy show, you have cancer, to more nuanced concepts like, you know, what, what are the receptor status results. So um, one of the things that we also were able to achieve is some harmonized language across cancer types. So in working with bladder cancer patients and prostate cancer patients and breast cancer patients and colorectal cancer patients, some of the concepts and language that we produced could be standardized and then personalized for each cancer type. And so, you know, in particular for grade and surgical margin status, we were able to come up with some harmonizing language across PCPRs, which again speaks to the idea of maybe having increased efficiency for the development of a new PCPR for a new cancer type that we haven't worked in as yet. We also worked with risk management. Um, this was really important to everyone on the team, our pathology partners, our clinician partners, to make sure that we had uh, uh, a good disclaimer. You know, these reports are not meant to be, you know, the foundational document for your pathology. These are meant to be a tool that potentially helps you better understand your pathology. So it was important to have some caveats and a disclaimer at the bottom of the PCPRs. So we started with this workflow that seemed to make sense to us. And in doing this work for the last five, six years, we've come up with sort of these different phases where along the way we integrate, and this is going back to that user-centered design model, we integrate input from our patient experts and our clinician and pathology experts 
to finally arrive at something that we can test and evaluate in clinical practice. So this led us to a breast surgical pathology uh, report. And I will say this was the, the hardest report that we worked on um, because it's, it's just very complicated. And so this took us a long time to go from what we know should be in the report to what the report should look like that we actually use in clinical practice. And uh, Mark Kilgore um, uh, and Libby Parker did a ton of this work to try to figure out you know, how we can represent important information in ways that patients can understand. And our main clinical partner for this is Sarah Javid. Uh, and most of the patients that were included in the pilot came from her practice. But this is an exemplary um, patient-centered pathology report for breast surgical pathology. And this is hot off the press. Uh, we haven't uh, published this yet. We have a manuscript that's about ready to go out. But it showed that similar to prostate cancer, similar to bladder cancer, it appears that if you are exposed to a patient-centered version of your pathology report, that you have a bit of a better ability to communicate some of the important information about your new breast cancer diagnosis. Now these are all patients that have already had a biopsy, so they already know they have breast cancer. It doesn't have the uncertainty of like a removal of a renal mass. Um, and I think where we are learning that we can potentially do a better job is with some of the more nuanced pathology information like um, receptor status. I think what we've learned along the way too is that there are a number of gaps that this work really reveals. Um, so in bladder cancer, and in breast cancer, so I didn't show you the retention curves, but knowledge accuracy goes down with time, sometimes dramatically. And so we find that, you know, the information that patients are able to relay, you know, when you first kind of give them their report, and then when you reassess them one month, two months later, their ability to sort of regenerate that information is a lot more challenged. Um, and then in particular, when it came to our breast cancer reports, the ability to accurately report your receptor status among PCPR recipients actually didn't go down all that much, but it actually went up a lot in our control patients. And there may be some reasons for that uh, because these are small pilots. So even in a small pilot, there's gonna be heterogeneity between your treatment arms. Across cancer types, we found zero impact on patient provider communication. But if you look at our patient provider communication scores, they are exceptionally high for all patients across all cancer types. And this is where you know, we kind of struggle with some of this work that we hope benefits patients or benefits communication with doctors when we do these pilots here. So I will tell you the, the main recruiter for our bladder cancer pilot was my partner, Jonathan Wright, and he is an unbelievably outstanding communicator. Um, and our main partners for our prostate cancer pilot uh, are Bill Ellis and Dan Lynn. And Dan Lin takes the time to create this huge document that he gives to patients every time he talks to them about their new prostate cancer diagnosis. Sarah Javid is an unbelievably talented communicator about a really stressful time in a, a breast cancer patient's life. And so I think we confront that when we try to see if these reports help with patient-doctor communication. I think if we were able to work with a more heterogeneous population of clinicians with more heterogeneous communication abilities, that these reports might demonstrate you know, a greater benefit in this domain. Similarly, it didn't appear to impact decisional conflict or decisional uncertainty. And again, those scores were pretty uniformly high. And so I think if we wanna evaluate these you know, in a more generalizable patient population, we definitely need a more generalizable provider population as well. We also had some implementation barriers and we mapped them to a framework for implementation science called the REAIM framework. So in terms of the reach of what we've done, we found that it's feasible to generate these reports in four cancer types. We have good effectiveness data for three of the cancer types. It appears to be easier based on the complexity of the reports themselves to do this for diagnostic biopsies than to do it for surgical pathology. Um, um, so you know, in moving forward, if there are a way to focus on, for example, breast core biopsy rather than breast surgical pathology, that might be the area in a patient's clinical cancer trajectory where we can have a greater impact. Um, in terms of effectiveness, it does appear that these tools improve, at least in the short term, patients' knowledge for their new cancer diagnosis. I will say, you know, one of the questions that we asked all of our patients in all of our pilots 
We asked them about their confidence in their report, their attitude toward the PCPR report, and over 90% of patients like the report and think that it should be included in their clinical care. It's just, you know, that positivity didn't translate to some of the other outcomes we would hope to see. Um, in terms of adoption, you know, um, uh, I'm not a cancer patient, and so it's hard for me to extrapolate what I think would be helpful if I were in their shoes to what they're operationalizing as they're going through their process. But it does appear that few patients brought the PCPR when they were in the PCPR arm to their clinic visit. And so I think what we have to do is maybe go back to square one and think about how these tools can properly be integrated if we think they're important into the clinical workflow of a new cancer diagnosis. In terms of implementation barriers, um, this was most notable with our breast cancer reports, but we confronted this a little bit with our bladder cancer reports too, which is clinical complexity and multiplicity of specimens. So, you know, that sort of easy button that you could hit and it would generate a, a report, it kind of broke down when there was a multiplicity of specimens. And Mark would have to, uh, by hand, generate a patient-centered pathology report, which is an increased burden on him. With bladder cancer, we sometimes have three, five, you know, seven bladder biopsies and an upper tract biopsy or a prostate biopsy. And that multiplicity of specimens was hard to create a workflow that would then translate that into a PCPR. And then in terms of maintenance, you know, a lot of the work that we did, so we worked with Will Chan in the Department of Pathology and he did a ton of work to build this out in PowerPath and worked hard to iteratively update these tools so that they were more accurate when we generated the PCPRs, but all that's moot. So post D1, all that work basically exists in the past. So how can we think about this in a way that's a bit more sustainable? Uh, maybe an easier problem is that pathology changes. You know, when I started here at UW, we talked about Gleason grade and Gleason sum. Now we talk about Gleason grade group, which is a complete redefinition of how we score. Um, the grade on prostate needle biopsies and prostatectomy specimens. And so these things change, and we need to make sure that if we're building these reports, that they can evolve with changes in what we know is important in pathology. So one way to do it and to think about, you know, how we can take these reports and make them available to a broader audience of patients or maybe study them with a broader audience of patients, irrespective of the EHR that their health system operates in, is with some novel tools that process uh, uh, text information. And so what we've been working on for about the last year is uh, Pathology Translator. And the idea is that a patient can take a picture of their pathology report, and that iteratively produces a personalized patient-centered pathology report. Sounds really cool. When we first had this idea, off-the-shelf optical character recognition didn't exist, so we couldn't really do it. Now you can pull down uh, basically an app that does optical character recognition, so that means you take a picture and then you have to read the text from the picture, right? Like if you think back to how Acrobat Reader worked, it used to be you couldn't just highlight text on the reader and copy and paste it, now you can't. So that's optical character recognition. So you use optical character recognition to read the text, and you read it into these natural language processing models, and what they're looking for are strings of text for which we have sort of uh, uh, recognition spidey sense. So we know that if we observe this string of text, that means this bit of pathology information, and then you apply some machine learning models to output the patient-centered content. And so, to date, you know, we've looked at about 403 annotated prostate biopsy pathology reports, and we split them into a test set, which is 70% of the cohort, and a validation set, which is 30% of the cohort. And our models are reasonably accurate. And so it seems like our models are best for things like uh, non-acinner histology, uh, volume of cores, definitely for Gleason sum. It's exquisitely accurate for Gleason sum. Um, but, um, number of positive cores has been really hard. And so this is you know, an example of how we try to use this accuracy data before this is ready for prime time to make sure that when we actually put this out there, the reports that are gonna be generated are accurate. This was uh, work that a couple of UW design students uh, and data science students did a lot of work on and now we're partnering with um, Amazon Web Services to try to accelerate this to something that has potentially um, some legs. 
you know, with the overarching goal of helping a broader population of patients with new cancer diagnoses. Um, so this work uh, does not take place in isolation. I get to stand up here and represent this work to you, so thank you very much for being here, but there's a huge team involved. Um, on the left is the current ClearPath team. Um, so I love acronyms for grants. The best acronym that I've ever been a part of is I'm PI of a pragmatic trial in bladder cancer. And if you know how bladder cancer is diagnosed, it's diagnosed with cystoscopy. And so that acronym is CISTO. It's Comparison of Intravescal Therapy and Surgery as Treatment Options for Bladder Cancer. That's the best one I've been a part of. But I really like ClearPath. Um, we're clarifying language, education, and readability around pathology. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think... Um, the group that's on here in that left-hand column has put in a number of hours to make a small pilot happen. And a lot of background happened before we even got to the pilot, um, and so um, I'm very grateful uh, to those individuals. And then, you know, this has also been a forum that's really supported um, uh, mentored trainees. Uh, we wouldn't even be here today without Matt Mosin and really um, leading a lot of the early foundational work that led to the bladder biopsy um, report. Jay Nyack was a urologic oncology fellow in our department who led the prostate biopsy pilot. Um, and both of those uh, helped us acquire the funding that kind of was able to accelerate this to a bigger program, we hope. So thank you very much. And I want to thank Larry again for the invitation. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. For the control group, um did, did you guys look at actually the education level of the control group? Because I was going to presume that that would probably affect the statistical significance of the difference there. It is. So um, uh, in our, our bladder and prostate uh, studies, for whatever reason, the education level was consistently higher among controls. In our breast cancer pilot, the difference is significant. So um, a, a much larger proportion of our PCPR participants in the breast cancer pilot had at most a high school education than our control patients. And that's one of our hypotheses for why their retention scores, their one month later scores went up. Um, you know, maybe that increased education level and increased health literacy helped them go back you know, or, or have better conversations with their provider team to become more sort of emboldened with knowledge for their report. And that's really why you know, I think that these small pilots can be suggestive, but if we really want to demonstrate the effectiveness of these tools, we need a, a bigger study where some of that education level variation that you see in a small pilot gets distributed over the entire study. Thank you. Sir? Uh, so I take it these are computerized reports generated from kind of bucketed information, like grade, stage, that gets fed in and whatnot. Uh, how, how do you deal with areas where there's more nuance or uncertainty that's being demonstrated in a PATH report, or is that not really an intended use of these patient care or patient-centered patient, patient -centered models? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. And um, so um, we were lucky. So w when we did the bladder and the prostate reports, those were all manually generated by our team. That was sort of a on our own backs pilot study, you know, without larger funding. With the breast and colorectal, we were able to use PowerPath sort of automatically generated reports. And, and that's where not every report was able to be easily translated into a PCPR just by hitting the button, where some of that nuanced information really was hard to automatically port over. I think that where I would hope that this would go would be to take away any burden on the pathologist who's reading the pathology because they're already busy um, and, uh, and so, you know, Mark, who was part of the study, you know, he was very happy to do that round of QA and make sure that the report was correct. But um, that's where potentially something like the pathology translator tool is actually better equipped to generate the PCPRs automatically because it can potentially recognize some of that nuance and have some solutions for it. Um, and so actually, I think there's maybe greater potential to generate more accurate or tools that maybe have some of the information that we can't do in like Epic Beaker, or like a, like a figure, there's maybe more of an opportunity to do that in those. Uh, we've been lucky in that most of the sort of critical elements have been those easily transportable, you know, content areas like stage and grade. Larry? One, <clears throat> one of the things, maybe this is premature, but I know in the score you talked about 
patient-generated uh, problems that they've perceived in care and procedures, and those being some of the things that most concern them. I had a sense you're going to be working on that as a as a project. Well, so library. Yeah. So this is like a little bit of a a different thing, but um, very interested in patient-generated data and how we can uh, learn from it. So um, I was very inspired, this was like my first year here, by a talk by uh, this guy Paul Wicks, who is with Patients Like Me. So if you don't know, Patients Like Me was one of the first sort of um, patient-oriented websites where patients could share information. It was a big chat room. They also collected PROs. It was built because their friend was dying of ALS. And so they realized that with such a rare disease, it was hard to create a community locally, so maybe they could create a community globally. Well, they did this really amazing thing where they observed that within their system, they saw a lot of chatter about off-label use of lithium to assuage the functional decline of ALS. So they studied it, and, and this is, I, hope, I think this is maybe what we're talking about is, they were able to do what I consider to be a very high-level comparative effectiveness research study with patient-generated data, where they were able to use Bayesian models to match the functional decline of users who did and did not use lithium before and after the lithium exposure and show that post-lithium exposure there was no difference in the continued functional decline, all from patient-generated data within their system because they would assess people every you know, three months with these patient-reported outcomes. And so it was one of the first studies I've ever seen that I think achieved sort of clinical practice changing comparative effectiveness data from patient generated information. And I think, you know, it influences how I think about things like the pathology translator. You know, can we continue to learn how to do a better job with these tools from data within the system? Does that answer your question? Eric Connick online says you noted that ERPR and HER2 status in breast cancer reports did not have the same comprehension as the diagnostic section of the report. Do you have any suggestions for clear communication for other biomarker results that are critical for treatment options? PDL1, GFR, BRAF, etc. I think um, this is where this sort of positive versus negative can be, I think, confusing for patients. Um, I think what we need to do, which we haven't done yet, is we need to go back and see which patients have sort of given our, 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 us permission to recontact them and to see why those gaps occurred. I also think, um, so what we started doing as a consequence of some of that is we've started doing a systematic review to look at knowledge as a study outcome. So knowledge has sort of distinguished itself as the one thing that clearly seems to have a differential outcome in our pilots. But, you know, if you, if you look at clinic, you know, clinicaltrials.gov, there aren't a lot of studies that use knowledge as a primary endpoint. And how we measure it might not be the right way to measure it. We essentially do an open text response, what is your stage of breast cancer, and then we have independent raters score the response. And we're a little bit harsh about the response, and we were particularly harsh about the receptor responses. And so maybe there's a better way for us to ask the question and, and really sincerely assess knowledge for that outcome, but I think that's actually one of the things that we really want to do. So if, if we're going to take this and do like a multi-center study, I think we all need to have the confidence that our communication about ERPR HER2 is better than it was in our pilot. I'm fascinated by the kind of the machine learning that you're going to be doing with the optical character recognition, and I'm thinking to my kids, and they, they can read very well, but when they want to look something up on the internet, they go right to YouTube. And they want to see somebody talking to them and telling them what they're supposed to learn. I'm curious, is anybody looking into video clips? That, because they're kind of canned comments, yeah. if you will, in pathology, not always, but in many cases, there are canned comments. Is there any way to get that read, to, rather than having the person read it, get it, get it read to them? I think that's a great idea. I mean, that's one of the benefits of something like an app-based tool is that you can do that. So I'll tell you, um, this isn't with the PCPR, but this is with some of the quality of life work that we have done. So we built these quality of life dashboards where uh, you can look at your quality of life score and compare it to scores of, of men like you, because it's for prostate cancer. And, um, and it maps to these three domains of graphic literacy. How am I doing, which is just reading. How am I doing compared to other men, which is reading between. And 
what can I expect in the future, which is reading beyond. But those tools were targeting, you know, probably again, high health literacy users thinking about who our pilot group was. And so we actually went back and we partnered with uh, someone that I, I worked with when I was at UCLA and we targeted an at risk for low health literacy population and reading it to me was a very common response. You know, could you build something that communicates these results to me verbally or with a video instead of with a graph? Because graphic literacy is actually really hard. I mean, we're talking about health literacy. Graphic literacy is like a, a level above that uh, that's, that's very challenging to communicate. And I think that's great. You know, YouTube is full of some really fantastic science communicators. Um, and I think there are some really good health communicators on there as well, but I think that's a really potentially great solution, especially when we think about pathology translator. So uh, Patrick Mathias in our department has done a lot of work about how, or some work about how cost effective it is to, to give clinical decision support, especially for, for pharmacogenetics. And how sometimes it's, we do a lot of work for this for a little bit of widget that gives a marginal benefit. Um, and, and, and that the benefit really extends when you can go to multiple institutions, multiple different places, which of course all have different EHRs or, or different versions of the same EHR, which are really different EHRs. What, what's the plan for being able to, you know, if you find things that make a big difference, what's the plan for being able to implement those on a larger scale where, where they're not just kind of helping the small number, relatively small number of patients we have? Very small number, yeah. Very small number, and, and now, right now, because we've transitioned to Epic Beaker, n no patients are getting these. Um, so um, that, that's one of the issues. That every time you update your EHR, all of a sudden the tools you spend so much time building totally uh, have to be rebuilt or disappear. Totally, I think that um, that that exact question is what led us to shift away from PowerPath and lab information systems to uh, web or app-based tool because. It just wasn't going to be feasible, um, and you know, D1 reallocated a ton of resources away from any chance we had of doing something PCPR related, which I get. Um, we did partner, so one of our partners is the University of Iowa, and they were an early EPIC adopter. Um, and so um, we're trying to figure out if we can try to do something in parallel with the pathology translator within EPIC Beaker because it is such a dominant lab information system now across the US, I am a little bit snake bitten. Um, and so I also recognize from our quality of life dashboard work that when you construct tools that are external to the EHR, doctors don't use them. And so you know, this is sort of one of the critical barriers to us going to the next level for this. I think for a multi-center trial, where we might be able to better demonstrate the effectiveness of the PCPRs and potentially signal some of these outcomes we hypothesize would be better, but we've just never been able to show it, I think the pathology translator would be a good artifact for achieving the PCPR generation. But if we want this to be meaningfully integrated into clinical practice, it has to be part of the EHR. And so I haven't come up with a perfect solution for that yet. Larry and I are meeting tomorrow. I don't know if that answers. I think, you know, I, 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 I am a big fan of clinical decision support tools. Um, one of the best tools that I was ever a part of was a, a tool where um, we prompted uh, veterans at the West Los Angeles VA um, who were active smokers. So you have their diagnosis, they're an active smoker, and then they have a smoking related urological diagnosis, erectile dysfunction, bladder cancer, kidney cancer. Uh, and we prompted the provider to refer them for smoking cessation counseling. The West LAVA has a really effective uh, behavioral uh, uh, model of, of smoking cessation counseling. It has really great outcomes for abstinence at six months. So if they complete it, it's a great proxy for abstinence. That CDS tool, the marginal benefit was astoundingly high because you know that the difference that you're making is a pretty substantial difference. Here locally, we were able to do something similar with overuse of um, of high radiation imaging in the ER for suspected stones. So we were able to rapidly decrease use of contrast-based imaging, high radiation imaging, and focus on low-dose non-contrast-based imaging in the ER for suspected stones. But those are arenas where you know the marginal benefit 
based on the gap in care you observe is potentially really high. So those are like incredibly high value CDS tools with minimal investment. But some other tools I agree, you know, it could be a lot of work for, for, to make that widget for a marginal benefit. So it's trying to figure out what those high value areas are. So I, I'm rambling, but you know, this was a big part of uh, the ACA, uh, which was the, the Affordable Care Act, which was um, to, to not necessarily focus on elimination of low value services, which unfortunately is a lot of US healthcare, but to focus instead on optimizing delivery of high value services, like streptococcal, you know, uh, I don't want to say vaccination because apparently that's bad, but streptococcal vaccination for people over 65, right? Or um, cervical cancer screening for, for women. These high value services, you know, they were made free for most, most people. Um, and, and so I think thinking about that, other than elimination of low value services where the marginal benefit is intrinsically going to be low. All right. Thank you guys for the fantastic questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.